Good evening and welcome to the uh, December meeting of the, of the East Chester Board of Fire Commissioners. Uh, we've already had the Pledge of Allegiance. We're coming back from executive session. So I'd look for a motion to return from executive session. Motion. Second. November, our treasurer John Malzari passed away, and it was a, a major blow to the to the fire district. Uh, John was a dear friend, um, a wonderful person, wonderful man. Uh, we grew very close in the two and a half years he worked at the fire district, and it was just a, a shocking loss for everybody at the fire district. And um, you know, I, not much more to say other than he was just an absolutely wonderful person, and he helped the fire district out tremendously in his two and a half years. And um, it was just a, it was a very sad month. We also had uh, Captain Nick uh, Dietrio passed away, and Captain Nick was, I didn't know Captain Nick, but from the membership, he was extremely well-liked. He was uh, very close to many of the members in the department, and uh, he was sorely missed, and, he's, and it, was, it was just a very sad month, the month of November, for the East Chester Fire District. Um, uh, uh, Chairman, don't forget the... And tonight we attended the wake for Mrs. Malongo, which was just the mother of one of our members, uh, Jerry Malongo. And uh, it's just been, it's been a very difficult six weeks for the, for the membership. Um, so that hopefully will, 2016 will be a little better than we ended 2015. So um, that'll bring me to tonight's meeting. Um, we'll start out with... Four sets of minutes to approve. Um, we have the minutes from the October 20th award ceremony. We have the minutes from the budget meeting of October 20th. We have the regular meeting of October 20th. We had three meetings in a row. The uh, award ceremony went very, very well. This is our first televised meeting since October because the November meeting, we all we did was interview uh, the lieutenant. Uh, firefighters and lieutenants, three each, to promote to the position of captain and lieutenant. So that meeting was really just a personnel meeting. Uh, so this is our first real televised meeting. And we have the regular minutes of the November uh, of the November meeting, November 10th meeting. So I would look for a, a motion to accept uh, all four sets of minutes. I think all board members are at every meeting. So we can do it on one motion. Second. That's uh, Peter. And Steve. All in favor? Aye. 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 Chief Grogan is not with us tonight, um, although he did want me to, to pass along that during this month we did a live burn exercise. The fire department had a second training day where they did a live burn exercise. Um, and it worked out very well. What they did was they took uh, material from this project that's going on on Marbledale Road, the trusses. They brought them up to the highway, town highway yard. They made them um, load bearing and they ignited them. And they wanted to see how long it would take for those trusses to fail. And uh, it was a it was a well done training exercise. It had very good turnout. Um, it kind of surprised the membership. Could, secondhand communications back to me it surprised the membership at the speed of which that wood failed uh, now that wood was not being covered by sheetrock which would normally be covered by in a normal burning environment uh, but the wood failed quicker than the, than the membership thought and it was a good learning exercise for the members to know uh, what they're dealing with because one of the major concerns of a truss structure is a collapsing structure when it gets too hot if the sprinkler system fails or something now this building has sprinkler systems in the trusses and outside the trusses, so that should mitigate the collapse issue, but uh, it's still a, a concern that the membership has to be aware of when, they, when they're training. And this was, a, this was a very good exercise that the chief brought up, and uh, Captain Ferrara, I think, spearheaded the operation, and it was uh, well received by the membership, and it's one of the good things that we got done this month was getting that training drill off the ground. So 
thank the chief for getting off the ground and the memberships who the members who attend. Um, also, this month we last month November meeting we promoted Phil Pinto to captain, so he's our he's our next he's a now on duty as a captain, and we promoted firefighter John O'Leary to lieutenant, so he's now um, wearing he's now a lieutenant, and that was at most of our November board meeting. I'll make a passing note. Um, I was at a function during the holidays, a Christmas tree lighting, and uh, it was at the Cottle School, and one of our fire fighters did a phenomenally good job saving a small child while I was there, and I had my bad, somebody pointed out to turn around, and that little child over there was just choking, and uh, firefighter John B. Lieutenant uh, John DiPotetto was able to uh, remove the obstruction in the child's windpipe in a matter of seconds and help save that child and uh, and he was so nonchalant about it afterwards I mean it was like he did it very quickly and he was extremely nonchalant about it and it was you know quite good um, so we got the four six minutes now I'll move on um, we have the treasurer's report um, as I mentioned John Mulls already passed away Mary Lou Falcone and the chief and myself somewhat have been filling in doing the documents and the paperwork. We have a stack of bills here tonight that have all been gone through. I actually did the certiorities right here and um, we'll approve those shortly. We have one issue on tax receipts. The town of East Chester gets the tax money for, uh, collected and then distributes to us. They are currently holding back 10% of our tax receipts. We've asked our law firm to, receipts, uh, uh, to research that law about their ability to hold back the 10%. They, they, um, we provided them with uh, the information from Mr. Wolf years ago, had done the research himself, and they concur with Mr. Wolf's research, not surprisingly, that his legal research was very good. And um, so we're going to send a letter off with our findings to the town, and hopefully the town will release the money, and we're hoping we don't have to go to a next step. But that's what we're going to do at this point. Um, committee reports, I don't almost think we should pass through the committee reports and move right to the business because a lot of the business is covered up to that. Is that okay with you? Right. Anybody else here? I have no problem with that. We can always go back. We need to. Right. So the first order of business tonight is we have the fire district election and uh, Tom Andres is here who is the chairman of elections. So Tom, can you <coughs> present your certificate of your certificate? Uh, six Shady Lane in East Chester, and I have the like to read to you the certificate of results uh, for the annual election. Uh, I, Thomas Andrus, being chairman of election, do hereby certify that the annual election of the town fire district of the town of East Chester, New York, held therein on December 8, 2015. The following facts are true and correct with respect to the East Chester, New York fire district. With respect to the election of one Fire District Commissioner for a full term of five years, commencing January 1, 2016 and terminating December 31, 2020, the total number of votes cast was 1,590. There were no uh, write-in uh, votes. The votes were cast for the following candidates for the Office of Fire District Commissioner for the full term of five years. For Mr. Dennis J. Winter, 1,115 votes. Ms. Cara M. Piliero, 475 votes. And uh, these results were uh, presented to the uh, town clerk on December 11th uh, as required. Um, so I, I'd like to, to give to you the results. I did send these to you. <laughs> okay. Oh, we're, thank you, Tom. Um, special thanks, if you will, to the board for their confidence in me to uh, run the election, and also uh, to thank uh, Chief Grogan and uh, Mary Lou Falcone for all the, the help and support that they gave me from the office uh, trying to get everything put together. It was uh, made a job a lot easier than it, it, it 
it usually is. Yeah, and this Thank is you very much. this is not a small to job, Tom. This is you have to get the books from the county, all the distribute them to the five polling places. You have multiple polling places per polling stations per polling place. You have to organize over forty, about approximately forty people, to um, to man those polling places. And uh, I, you did a phenomenal job as always, and it was smoothly run and. Um, the turnout was large. We handled a very large, one of the larger turnout we've had in many, many years, and uh, well, I can remember even. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it all went very smoothly, and you did a phenomenally good job as usual. And thank you. There's one thing I would like to mention, and that's all the people that came to work for us, the 40 odd people. Was it 35 or 40 people? 36. 36? Yeah. I, I think would they deserve a lot of thank yous because. Uh, they come the night before and they come to the swearing in and then they go to their polling places. This year they had good weather to go to the polling places. Sometimes they go snow and ice. And I think as a board we should lobby the New York State Legislature to so they can at least make minimum wage and change the, have the law changed for a lot far district like ours so we can pay them at least minimum wage. Uh, they're currently locked into that $50 and it's just and you're volunteering all your time to do this. Um, I, I think we should we should make an effort to make our legislator aware of the problem, and hopefully they can they can do that. I, I hope it works better than our attempts to uh, move the election to the regular election cycle, which is what we try to do beforehand. And we're still that's still a work in progress. Still a work in progress. We 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 have to get the state senate to agree to it. Even though our senator, Mr. Latimer, is working extremely hard to do it. He's not getting support in the, from his other senators. Uh, but Tom, thank you very much, and you was, you know, and say thank you. Did Tom make the same amount of money as everybody? Yeah, he made. He gets paid fifty dollars like everybody else. So Tom works for, you know, he's the Tom. The number of hours Tom puts in to get this organized, it's almost a month's worth of work. Oh, it's I, I'm impressed. You did a great job, Tom. So for the same for the same discount rate as everybody else. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. So that's the election. Okay. Next up, we have to replace car 2102, which I'll explain that. And I see Glenn's here and uh, John's here, um, who worked, uh, Glenn Strawberry and John have worked, um, uh, did a lot of work on putting the specs for this car together. The specs are probably 50, 50 pages or more, and uh, and so um, this is about a year and a half in the making. Where a little longer than that, I'm being corrected. It's been a slightly longer than that. But um, what basically we have is our command car is a uh, Chevy Suburban or a GMC Suburban, typically, and NFPA standards does not want the equipment to be in the same. Uh, compartment as the member, the driver or the or the chauffeur, the chauffeur or the or the or the other firefighter, or in our case the captain the in the vehicle, the officer in the vehicle, and that's for if something they have to stop short or get in an accident, they could have projectiles coming at them, and two, it's not good for the equipment to be bounced around in unsecured areas. So, uh, after a, a, a long research and many coffees over the table, I'm sure, they've uh, decided on to get a pickup truck with a modified bed in the back, a customized bed in the back that bolts on to the back of the pickup truck and therefore this customized compartment will hold all the different tools they need to carry because people don't realize one of the objects, that one of the problems with fire trucks is the compartment space. Mm -hmm. It's not so much the pump size and how much water it puts out, it's compartment space for gear. And that's really one of the big pushes in, in fire apparatus, emergency apparatus, is how much gear can I carry on four wheels or eight wheels? And so uh, this is going to give us more compartment space, safer compartment space, but it's not cheap. Um, so the truck, and the, you, you, we're getting a brand new Chevy Suburban, uh, excuse me, Chevy pickup truck, and we're going to mount a bed, uh, mount a, a cab on the back. So uh, similar to how a camper would mack on the back of a pickup truck. Right. So the we went out for public bid, and Hendrickson, Hendrickson Fire Rescue Equipment from 140 Hoffman Avenue, Icelandia, New York, came in at $129,500. Uh, 
um, if we want to get scene support lighting it's an extra five thousand dollars and these are LED scene support lighting that you would illuminate all four sides of the vehicle with a command switch to choose to illuminate um, to illuminate a scene my guess is the scene support lighting is probably a good thing to have because yeah. this truck's going to be around for hopefully five or seven years and this truck we have now is a 2007 this is 2015 so it's been in operation eight years our current rig this is a nine month lead to get this piece of apparatus so one of the questions was if we order the truck and the body is not made at the same time when does the warranty start on the truck and so we're gonna get the warranty to start when the truck is delivered so we don't have a warranty clicking away while the cab is being built Good. so that's where we are so I think if we go want to go with the 134 five proposal the car the vehicle comes with scene support lighting you gentlemen are nodding your heads well, if that's going to help the, yeah, if that's going to help them do their job and increase safety, yeah, it's only five thousand dollars. Right. There, what, uh, you, uh, John Rochelle is saying is that on Parkway and dark scenes, you the having the ability to illuminate the whole area is 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 well worth it. Small price to pay. Yeah. Um, there's another issue. There was one other option. And that was a three-way camera that when you put your blinker on, you have profile on either side of the vehicle as soon as you put your blinker on as you're backing up. I don't know if that is as critical as just having a stern light, a, 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 rear, a rear camera. Um, you guys, do you generally want to step up and have an opinion? or? Okay. We're all boaters, so we refer to stern, not back. <laughs> One question I would have on these uh, the Army. Do we think that the chassis of the 350 is going to be similar enough that if the truck itself goes after five years, we could take this bed and just put it on the new one? In the past, we used to buy a Suburban, put it in the shop for roughly two to three months while the mechanic customized it with our radios, our stripes, our, you know, and we'd go out and buy the stripes ourselves and buy all the incidentals to put on. Um, this is going to be delivered with all the Z with all the safety stripes and NFPA standard striping on it. So, yeah, with the radios installed and all that stuff. It won't be in the shop. Uh, other than getting washed, hopefully. I realize I'm dating myself, but can we make it look like the emergency squad 51 truck? <laughs> that would make me feel better. <laughs> okay, then. Thumbs up. Okay, so I look for a motion and a second to award the bid to Hedrickson Fire Equipment of Hoffman Avenue, Islandia, for $134,500 to provide a new command vehicle, a.k.a. Uh, car 2102. I make that motion. And Mr. Baker. Second. Second is Peter. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the next thing we have tonight is um, insurance. Our general liability insurance is up. We had some dis uh, emails back and forth that it might be the best way to do this is to go with a higher deductible and keep the price relatively the same. <coughs> and we, we looked at our um, history of um, claims, and so um, I think that's what we've decided to go with was the last where we increase the deductible to $10,000 for building and property. Which we have never filed a claim on in the last five years. Right, right. We have not, if I haven't passed that down. So we would um, increase the increase to a 10,000 deductible building and property. Apparatus goes to dollars $2, and the auto comprehensive stays as is. The auto vehicle comprehensive because the savings was only two hundred fifty-eight dollars. All the deductions add up to eight hundred. Our new policy costing uh, basically slightly less than last year. We would spend eighty-eight thousand five hundred nine dollars and twenty-one cents if we did that. Did you say we're increasing the uh, apparatus to 
2500 or to 5000 uh 5000 5, We apparatus is going to thought it was going there two and a half. There's a, there's a supporting page from behind it. Yeah, that was the supporting page. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So I look for a motion. Um, after discussion, um, to award to Arthur J. Gallagher Risk Management Services for 2016 at a cost of $88,509.21. The premium was obtained by increasing the deductibles. Um, and this is to renew the general liability insurance with the Arthur, G Arthur J. Gallagher Agency. They're our agent. So um, do I have a motion to that? I'll make the motion. So I'll make the motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Either all in favor? All right. All right. All right. All right. So that's that. Um, okay. We have another insurance. We have one fireman who is not in the proper um, retirement system, being 384D versus 375I. Um, this has been an issue that's been going back and forth for a number of years. And uh, it took a legislative change to get the, the New York State Legislature and our Assemblywoman and um, Senator to work on this with the union to get this processed. And I think everybody's in agreement. It's not a cheap fix, but it has. To, we only have one member in the wrong plan. So um, these are going to be several motions to resolve this. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, the. You want to? Um, has this guy been in the wrong? He's been about 18 years in the wrong system. Um, how did that happen? It's somewhat in dispute how it happened. Um, he's the only one out of the whole department that's been in the wrong. Yes, he's the only one out of the out of the whole department in as 375I. The interesting thing is, if somebody gets injured in the line of duty, injured in the line of duty, they'll run up to New York State and change switch immediately into 375I because they'll get benefits till they're 70. It's called a career plan. But this plan, every fireman that works for the fire district has a right to opt into 384. Uh, every fireman generally opts into 384. The question was, was there full disclosure when he joined the department that he had a right to go into 384? It wasn't uncovered in probably 2008, I'm guessing somewhere in that time frame. And there was some uh, back and forth, and we've had several grievances over the union over this back and forth. And uh, I think the board at that time, and, and it's my belief still, that the, um, the facts don't support the district. In other words, I don't know if the, if the administrator had enough ex training at the time to properly document the systems he was supposed to be in. The system, in other words, the, the file's somewhat lacking to prove that he was given the opportunity to switch systems. And uh, it's really not the union's responsibility to educate them on the system, it's the department's. So I think that's where we are. And uh, this has been ongoing for a, a number of years. I know this was coming up when I was first elected. We were discussing this. So is this going to resolve the issue and get him in the right? Yes, and this is not something that just happened overnight. This came about. I this came about earlier. We I think we got in November. We got this announcement that the New York State Legislature actually passed the law. Uh, that meeting was not televised. And it's enough money where we didn't want to do it at a, a non-televised meeting. So, um, in the interest of full disclosure, but that's why we're doing it now. And the other issue was we have to do it by 12:31. And last month when we got the notice, was, you know, we had issues in the front in that treasurer's office that. We had to get all the paperwork together and get our, our decks in order, and we're there. So that's why this is here now. This required an actual act of the state legislature to fix. Yeah, you see, what the, that's part also what the delay is. Correct. Yeah, no, we couldn't. We couldn't have fixed it without the union getting the state legislature to change the change uh, 
amend the law to allow us to put them in. Basically, is what it does. Okay, so shall I start? You can start. I'm asking for a motion authorizing Mary Lou Falcone to be the quote acting clerk close quote on all necessary aspects related to the. Sorry, do I, re I got to read his name right? Yes. Okay. Uh, related to the firefighter Ryan retirement matter and paperwork until such point as a new clerk can be appointed and to authorize the chair to take any other actions as needed on this matter. Motion is made by, I'll make the motion, Commissioner Baker, and we need a second. 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 Okay. I'll call the board. Mr. Lori? Aye. Commissioner England on? Aye. Commissioner? Aye. And I'll abstain because I'm being to execute the paperwork on that. Well, just on that one motion, I'll abstain. Do I go to the next one? Yep. Okay. Asking for a motion approving the resolution reopening section 34D of the Retirement and Social Security Law for Christopher Ryan is set forth in Chapter 291, Laws of 2015, and that be it resolved that the governing board of the East Chester Fire District does hereby assume the additional cost required to provide the reopening of section 384D of the Retirement and Social Security Law pursuant to Chapter 291 of the Laws of 2015. This resolution provides for a one-time expenditure of $93,100, that's $93,100, an estimated additional contribution by the fire district of approximately $9,150 annually. We need a motion in a second. I'll make a motion to that. I'll second. Uh, Mr. Lurie? Aye. Mr. Aye. 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 And I'll say aye. Okay. The next item I had down was budget transfers, but unfortunately I wasn't able to through the budget transfers for year-end balancing. Um, the next item, and thank you, gentlemen, for getting that done. Um, we had an oil tank in the Bronxville um, fire station that had to come out of the ground. It was in the ground for many, many, many years. It was taken out last, uh, I think on December 4th or 5th, it was taken out of the ground. Um, there was a small uh, hole discovered, not a hole, but like a, uh, it had leakage. It wasn't really, they didn't think it was that material, but the we normally inspect all tanks coming out of the ground. The fire department does. Our fire inspector, if you're getting an oil tank out of the ground, we inspect it. We can't inspect our own tanks. And this tank was larger than we would normally be allowed to inspect in the first place. So uh, Westchester County, working with um, Dutchess Environmental, took the tank out of the ground. They saw the excess oil. Uh, the tank had some contamination. The Dutchess has made a proposal to remediate that, but not limited to. So if we could find out it's more expensive or less expensive to remediate this ground. They don't think it's that severe, but the um, the estimate they delivered, and it's the same company that removed the tank, there's only really, we use, there's two firms that mostly do this around town. If you ever used, um, if you ever have work done, it's either in Dutchess Environmental or North Northeastern. So um, we have to remediate the ground now, and we have a temporary tank in place while we have a new double wall tank to be put in, but we can't put it in until the ground's remediated. So I would look for a motion to uh, for Dutchess Environmental um, to remediate the site of, of a removed fuel tank at an estimated cost of $10,708. And I ask for a motion to do that. Anybody? I'll make the motion. Second. Peter and uh, Anthony. Okay. Mr. Lorry? I second it. Okay. Mr. Baker? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hinkledon? Aye. Mr. Laurie? Aye. And I'll say aye, so we'll do that. I um, would like to make one comment about that oil tank, though. Uh, I don't remember the exact year the tank was put in. Do you by any chance? No, but it's going to be before, yeah. almost before you and I were born. It's a bit of a cautionary tale. We're going to be discussing another project in a little bit, and this is uh, an example of where we probably should have had far better, you know, maintenance of our facilities in the case of this oil tank. That thing should have come out of the ground years ago. And perhaps if we had taken it out after its useful life, it wouldn't have leaked and we wouldn't be incurring a $10,000 cost to remediate this right now. And like I said, I'm bringing this up uh, because it's going to be important uh, in a couple of minutes when we discuss uh, what we want to do at one of our firehouses where we have other issues. Uh, where the house is in disrepair and I think we will be facing in the not too distant future significant emergency repairs if we don't deal with them now and this is what happened here in my opinion I agree completely 
Um, speaking of the Bronxville Firehouse, we have one more. Uh, the, the the chief had um, got a what are they the maintenance uh, the members in the in the station three have noticed leak in the stairwell area. Uh, we had uh, Martini Martinetti Martinetti rest, uh, restoration. Yeah, Martinetti. Uh, restoration came by Mariani Mariani restoration came by and gave us a quote they had done uh, extensive work on the roof a few years ago um, for six thousand nine hundred and seventy five dollars it's a slate roof with hidden gutters I don't know if people know that roof but it doesn't have gut it has gutters but they're hidden they're stepped back into the eaves um, so we got a quote to fix that of six thousand nine hundred and seventy five dollars we only have one quote on the subject from the same company who had done work there in the past so, so we can so we don't fix it it's going to get worse and yeah, that's the, the weather's been nice so far but when winter does come it's going to cost us tens of thousands of dollars more to fix it later and to fix the damage that's going to happen right so this is an right. out of curiosity doesn't this fall under the below the threshold where the chief can unilaterally make an emergency yes yes but yeah. he he just got it the last couple days and thought he would since it's since it was timely for a board meeting, he passed it along. Okay. That's all. No, and so, if it was not, was a board meeting was two months away, or excuse me, a month away, he might not have. But since he just got it, he said, "Look." And he's not here right now. He's not here. He passed it along. Okay. So an action passed is an action completed. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So, um, so I wrote the resolution. Uh, would I'll, I'll make a motion that we retain um, the contracting firm. Uh, Mariani uh, restoration at six thousand nine hundred seventy-five dollars to do the repairs as listed. And I had the repairs here somewhere. I think they were emailed out. Do we need more than one quote, or we? It's preferably to have more than one quote. Mm -hmm. But my experience is even in my home lately, getting people to come by to do get quotes on slate roofs. It just you can spend a lot of time to get people to do small jobs. I, I just think that's the case. And this contractor has done work on this roof in the past. So, and based on his detailed estimate of exactly what he's going to do to fix the problem, it seemed reasonable. Right. Yeah, here's the. Uh, this was emailed out. He probably should have got a copy. There, yeah, I saw that. So, this is kind of a time of the essence uh, situation because the weather's good now and it's not going to be. Yeah. And it's under the threshold, so the chief actually wouldn't have had to get a second estimate, correct? No, he should. We, he, I mean, that's good practice. Good practice. We want to get more estimates, right? But, but he, he, I just happen to know that call. Right. I mean, I just had a window done recently, and I kept on calling and calling and calling, trying to get people. It was virtually impossible. Yep. Which is when, when the people don't like doing small jobs. It's just my experience. But um, I'll make a motion that we have the chief spend the money to do that. Have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so that was Dennis first and Peter. Okay. Um, now we also have, um, we need to appoint uh, an acting treasurer just for the next two weeks. Um, so at our reorganization meeting, we'll reappoint a treasurer hopefully. Um, and so we need to have somebody who's a quote the treasurer so i would make a motion that we appoint michael p grogan as acting uh, uh, dennis i don't think it's appropriate you're the chairman making a motion okay you, you want to make this make the motion i don't think it's proper whatever for you, for you to make i would look for a motion to appoint michael p grogan as acting treasurer I'll until make the motion okay. until okay fine mr laurie is making a motion to appoint michael p grogan as acting treasurer until 1231 um when the board plans to address this position at the January reorganization meeting, there'll be no change in compensation. This is just a title. And he's not, and the truth be said, Chief Grogan is doing all the checks, all the every you know everybody's getting their paychecks, their overtime, their uh, contractors are getting paid, and that's basically because Michael Grogan's putting in the extra hours, and, uh, and and he's getting it done, and it's you know he's stepping up and getting it done, and he should be commended for the extra. The efforts he's putting in and this doesn't increase his compensation or retirement package or anything it's just he's officially allowed to do this yeah he's allowed to do it and a board right. member can't do it right we can't we, do we, it we, we're not I'll, I'll second commissioner Lori's motion 
Aye. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 So, so it's just so we can say we have a treasurer, you know, because Mike is spending the money. He should be being called a treasurer. Uh, that moves us to uh, another issue that we have. We have, uh, we're going to be out looking for a treasurer. Um, we're looking for someone who has fire district, uh, well, ideally fire district experience. That's a limited universe of people who have fire district experience. We would like somebody who has municipal experience, somebody who has a bachelor's degree at a minimum, someone who is, um, has current market skills or highly proficient in Microsoft uh, Office, specifically Excel. They are um, very familiar with QuickBooks. They have could have an advanced degree. John Molazari had an advanced degree. He had a master's degree. He had 35 years in banking. He was just absolutely wonderful. John was wonderful, and I don't know if we'll ever find anybody who is credentialed as John, um, but we need a highly credentialed person if possible because the, the work in this office is, is, you know, it's a lot of money moving around, and it's a lot of liability if you get it wrong. So um, I circulated a memo to the board uh, with those um, qualifications should be, and we're going to put a uh, put out some advertisements or public make public notice that we're looking for someone. The law suggests that we hire someone within the town of Eastchester. If we can't find somebody in, living in the town of Eastchester or allowed to step outside the town of Eastchester, but we should look in the village of Bronxville, the village of Tuckahoe, the town of Eastchester first. Um, so if anybody's looking for a part-time job, they have current skill set, um, they have municipal experience, and um, this was about a 17-hour week job. That's what John did, 17 hours a week. Uh, we're flexible a little bit on the hours if we can get the right person. Um, and if you have a current day skill set when it comes to technology, that job is a lot quicker. John, even if you had a very good skill set, um, so I think that's that's what we're looking for. Anybody other comments for the board members? Salary commensurate with experience. Salary commensurate with experience. So yeah, and the hours, as Dennis said, are there's some flexibility in when you actually work those hours. So uh, I know there's a lot of talented, very well educated uh, people who maybe have taken some time to be uh, taking care of children who might be highly qualified and can do a job for 17 hours a week when their children are in school. So uh, we'd like to get the word out to as many people as possible in the community and yep. see if we can fill this with somebody who, who lives in town. Correct. So yeah, so we're, we're going to be eager to, to find someone because uh, Mike Rogan can't be spending, you know, all night and day doing the accounting. It's just not... You know, and, and I've been spending a little bit of time helping out. And so Mary Lou Falcone, which is the next topic I'm going to, Mary Lou Falcone is our uh, secretary to the Board of Fire Commissioners. And she's really stepped up. She's done a phenomenal job during the last, well, she's done a phenomenal job always. But in the last two months, she's really stepped up and, uh, and is looking for more uh, responsibilities in, that, in her position. Uh, she was brought on a few years ago in a, in a for a part-time position she still has a part-time position and can, will continue but the health care administration is also a large workload for the chief's been doing it uh, and John Mozari was doing it um, we would like to move that over to Mary Lou Falcone and when we do that we're gonna have to compensate her differently to do that so um, I would look for the board to adjust her salary rate to $35 an hour with the same time frame she's working now I'll make the motion to, uh, to compensate for her the time she's working and will make it effective the next pay period, starting the next pay period. I made the motion. I'll okay. second it. Okay. Uh, so the motion is that Mary Lou Falcone salary be adjusted to $35 per hour starting at the next pay period and she takes on the additional duties of um, health care administration and that would be total compensation, not an additional two. Okay. Of uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Baker? Aye. 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 And I'll say aye. Okay. So we got the roof done. We got the educational requirements done. Um, yes. uh, we did that with your resolution before the program. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yep. Um, so now we have um, 
I'm going to jump from our list here a little bit before we go to the building because that may take a little bit. Um, we put on the met on the agenda that endeavor to have all groups do standardized tactical and training. What that means is the board is, does not have any interest in getting into operational uh, uh, operations of the fire department. That's for the chief, the assistant chief, and the captains to discuss the operations. What the board would like is that if the membership all does the same thing in unison. So if group one's training has one that training regiment, group two has the same training regiment, group three has the same training, and four has the same training regiment. And if you're responding to an automatic alarm at, say, Lawrence Hospital, you can expect that all four groups on a typical automatic alarm are going to end up in the same location and not different captains are going to have different protocols for different buildings. Now, understand if there is a call coming in that says there's smoke on one side of the building, that's totally different. But on your normal automatic alarms, your normal training, your normal, there shouldn't be anyone training differently than the other groups. Whatever that training is, we're not telling you what the training is. It's not for the board to tell you how to train or what to train as far as the exact training, but it's to say everybody does the same training. And so I think we're going to look to the assistant chief uh, to make a, take a more leadership role in the um, training. Um, I guess that's what I think we're going to do. And, and that's so that the captains are all on the same page. They're all excellent. The captains are all excellent today. But we get feedback from time to time that different groups are doing different training, and we'd like to see everything the same. Well, it should be one, again, use the Army because it's a paramilitary organization. It's task, condition, and standard. There's one standard, one, uh, you know, schedule for everybody. So they're all, because you never know if a guy's filling into another group. Well, that's not how we do it in group two. You know, we do it this way. So that's what we're trying to get at. But as the chairman said, it's not up to us to tell you how to train or what to train on or you know what method to do it. Just we want it to be organized and consistent with a, with a training officer, so to speak, uh, or an operations guy doing that. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yep. Any other comments? Okay. The other th uh, on my agenda before we get to the is the we got a report back from the Eastchester School District on their fire inspection report, and uh, to me it was pretty much scandalous uh, it was the the report was very similar to the first report we got back this is not our fire inspector inspecting it this is they used the same fire inspector again he walked through all 400 500,000 square feet in one day he found very little wrong with the buildings when his walk through the chief is going to have the fire inspector go and reevaluate the building like we did a year ago and uh, for the life of me, I don't understand how they accept a report that they got. It, I just don't understand it. New York State has seemed to, New York Department of Education, we've had extensive communication with them, and they've seemed to gone to the route where they just want someone to tell them it's been looked at. They don't care how thorough it was. So as long as somebody tells them it's been done, they don't really want to know anything else. Um, they don't want to know the qualifications of the person who did it, how, how it was done. They just want to know that they got a form that said it was done on a computer file. Just to be clear, that's not the local people on the school board or anything. That's the state. That's the state. Right. That the state is happy with, just tell us we checked the box. Right. Uh, the um, And the report we got back is, did you see it, Peter? Did you see it? It was just, uh, yes. Yes. It was, <laughs> it was, you know, it's just unfortunate that, uh, that, you know, I think they should have us inspect their building every year look at our reports our reports will be thorough and detailed and any resident can just go and get the report and read ours and read theirs and see if there's a discrepancy you might find so um let's talk about um just heights do you want to do that peter sure uh just to start with a little bit of background uh earlier in the year we hired a uh, architectural engineering firm to perform a facilities condition uh, report and master plan for uh, our Chester Heights Firehouse, uh, which for those who in town who don't know where it is, it's 5 Oregon Avenue, southeast part of town, very close to the New Rochelle border. This house we identified as the one uh, house in our district which was in the most significant uh, level of, of disrepair and why we prioritized this house first. Uh, the report was uh, 
conducted by a firm called FSI Architecture. Uh, it's headquartered in New York City. They've got extensive experience, been in business over 25 years, and one of the principals of the firm is actually a town resident. Uh, the, uh, the report itself, the analysis was done uh, over one full day. There was a, a team of engineers that came in and inspected all the interior and exterior building elements, so flooring systems, roofing systems, windows, doors, etc. Uh, they also reviewed the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems. Uh, they prepared a report that identifies elements of the building uh, that are in need of repair, and if they can't be repaired or they're obsolete, need to be replaced. Uh, the report prioritizes those uh, according to how quickly they needed, you know, to address them is. Uh, and it also provides cost estimates based on current contractor uh, pricing in the area for what it would cost to do the work. Uh, as far as background on the house itself, the house was actually built in 1931. It was built as a firehouse, so it was purpose built uh, as a firehouse. It has not got undergone any significant renovation since the house was built in 1931, just minor renovations uh, on the margins. Uh, while the house served well for many years, I don't think that the design anticipated the changes in modern firefighting equipment, the evolution of firefighting equipment, where uh, a lot of the rigs today are substantially larger and substantially heavier than they were in 1931. Uh, and as a result, uh, the flooring system in particular has suffered a significant amount of damage from, you know, the increased weight of our, of our newer vehicles. Uh, the house itself is a Tudor style. It's three, there's a basement, there's a main floor. The main floor basically uh, is where we have our, our truck bays. There's a dormitory for firefighters there. There's a kitchen, there's a bathroom, there's a few offices. The second floor has a uh, very large uh, recreational space. It also has a kitchen, it has a bathroom. I believe there's a small office up there. It also has a service bar and two bathrooms. Uh, the second floor of this building is quite frankly a, a grand, beautiful space uh, and probably could be providing much more benefit to the district and the community if it were ADA compliant. Right now there's only a staircase to get up there. Uh, but uh, it is something that I think actually could uh, serve the community and like I said the district well and potentially have to look into it a little bit more uh, be an area where we could potentially generate revenue if, if we renovate that space properly uh, so that's basically a background on what we did who we hired to do it and the house itself as far as the findings uh, the report came back about a month ago and uh, kind of as expected, uh, FSI identified several things uh, which need to be addressed immediately. And when they say immediately, their time frame is within a year. Uh, they include, and it's not limited to these, but these are the big four in terms of cost. One is replacement of the ground floor flooring system. Uh, the current floor is severely and underdesigned uh, for current needs and has suffered considerable deterioration. Uh, the other would be repair, replacement of the exterior facade. Many of the timber framing uh, pieces on the exterior of the building are rotted. Uh, also, there is a, a brick facade on the front, which is actually starting to bow away from the building. Right now, it's being kept in place by a couple of uh, support two by fours. Uh, that needs to be you know, taken down and replaced. Uh, the roof also needs to be replaced. It's a slate roof, which is kind of at its, again, the building was built in 1931. We're 85 years later. You know, the useful life of a slate roof is around 100 years, so it's a little bit younger, but it's failing in many places. And <clears throat> at this point, the cost of repairing a slate roof probably doesn't make sense. It makes more sense to take the slate off and replace it with an asphalt roof. And then finally, uh, the other critical issue is the mechanical systems, namely the heat and hot water service in the building. The electric was one uh, system that was upgraded, I forget exactly how many years ago, but uh, is relatively new. Uh, the cost, excluding professional costs, meaning architectural fees, to do this work, their estimated range for those critical items alone is $1.1 to $1.8 million. Uh, 
guess we can kind of make an assumption that hopefully it would fall somewhere in the middle. So you're talking about a 1.5, you know, 1.4 to 1.5 cost to put on a new roof to basically remove the current floor in that building and replace it with a new one that will be, you know, strong enough to handle uh, the equipment that we use today and, in fact, over-design it so that if equipment gets even heavier, we'll be able to handle that. Uh, as well as replacing the mechanicals to the heating system uh, and the roof on the building. They also <laughs> identified a number of items which were <coughs> secondary uh, and needed replacement over the course of the next, you know, one to ten years. Now, some of these things would include, uh, for example, you know, kitchen and bath renovations, making the second floor ADA compliant, paint finishes. The cost of those range from 460 to 640k my own personal opinion is is that if we do embark on the priority items which i would recommend that we do we try we pursue this that we do it all at once the you know the additional incremental cost of coming back several years later getting architects in again to you know design those spaces hiring people for a smaller job i just think there'll be economies of scale in terms of having, you know, uh, the architectural engineering services done all at once and the work done all at once. So this is kind of what we're facing on this building. And my concern is, is that, you know, I, I don't know how many people, I mean, certainly everyone in the department is well aware of what's going on down there. Maybe not all residents are. Maybe the ones who live close <laughs> have driven by, walked by and said, eh, it's a little scary. If we don't do this, we are going to be spending a tremendous, tremendous amount of money in emergency repairs over the course of the next five years. I, I would almost guarantee it. Uh, you know, there are openings in the roof. There's, you know, birds, potentially raccoons living in spaces up there. Uh, we are certainly going to have, you know, leaks. The work kind of needs to be done, and I think we've we've neglected this for too long. So I think the discussion now is really in my opinion you know not whether it needs to be done but how how we get it done or whether or not there's an alternative uh you know that that might make sense now i think one alternative that has been raised by you know a couple of members of the board would be the idea of just raising the building and building a new one uh while this building needs a lot of work and it's going to cost a significant amount of money. In my opinion, you would not be able to build anything comparable for the cost of repairing this building. Structurally, the building is still sound. And so, you know, unless we were looking to kind of get rid of this building and then replace it with something that potentially wouldn't suit the architectural, you know, uh, the architecture of the area, for example, put up a, a steel building that wouldn't have a second floor meeting room, that wouldn't have, you know, something that was, you know, didn't provide uh, as much benefit to the district or the community, you know, I don't think it would be possible to build something similar for anywhere near the cost of repair. So in my opinion, that's not an option, but certainly we should discuss that amongst the board. There are also other things that potentially we could do and we should investigate to lower the cost to get it lower than what it is here. Even though the truck bays and the second floor are parts of the building which I would like to restore and, and get greater use out of, the basement, for the most part, has been used at times for a training facility, you know, facility and for storage. I don't think we necessarily need that basement. And the question becomes, if we've got to take the floor out to replace it anyway, perhaps does it make sense to fill the basement in. The basement's broken into two sections, uh, one which is underneath uh, the, uh, the truck bays, and then another section that houses the mechanicals. That could be left, but the area where the truck bays are could be filled in, and we might want to explore what the cost would be to fill that in uh, versus pulling the floor out, putting in new steel supports, and keeping the basement intact. So that's, that's basically where we stand. A couple of other things I would say. Uh, I think the report is excellent. It provides pictures so everyone can see. We actually uh, put the report up on the department website. Uh, if you were to go to uh, eastchesterfd.com, I believe, and uh, 
click, there's a link for miscellaneous documents. Uh, once you go in there, you can click again. You'll see, you know, uh, the title of the report is the East Chester Fire District Unit Union Corners Engine and Hose Company Number Four, and that'll be the report in its entirety, along with the cost estimates uh, to do the work. No, I concur with Peter on all points. Um, I think the Rehabilitation Act may uh, preclude us from doing any work without doing the second floor bathrooms for ADA compliance. Uh, I don't think you can spend that kind of money on a building without making it ADA compliant. I think we're be complete, precluded from doing so. Um, but it's a beautiful building. The second floor of that building is gorgeous. Uh, and it, it, you know, it, it probably needs to be brought back up. I guess the only question I can think of is funding and how do we fund it. And uh, I think that's going to end up being a bond issue. We currently have no debt. The fire district has no debt. And um, so I think we're going to fund that through a probably the most practical way to fund it. And when we go to buy apparatus, I think the practical way to fund that is apparatus as well, whether it's lease or purchase. But we're going to have some significant ticket items coming up. And I think the I think bonding, bonding is just we move this along. If we end up spending $2 million on this project, um, clearly that would be a bonding of bonding deal which would not be so horrible just because I think it's likely that these repairs would give us potentially another hundred year life of this building and we'd be bonding at a time when rates are still <coughs> despite the 25 basis point <laughs> rate hike today right. at historically low levels it, right. is, it is extremely uh, an extremely good time even now to, to borrow money so and, and thank you for Peter for getting that whole re doing this, being on top of that. You and Anthony for being on top of this um, report, and uh, it's available for anybody who wants it. Send us an email and we'll send it to you, or go to the website. Um, so that's on that we have to talk about. And the and the apparatus we need to know. We have to discuss apparatus replacement. One other item we have on here is amending the rules and regulations. The red book. Uh, Commissioner Baker is going to take a shot at redrafting the Red Book. It hasn't been updated in 16 years, so he's going to try to make it more current to the department. Um, and the law. And the law, yes. More importantly, the law. And the, yeah. And so the Red Book needs to be updated. And Stephen, uh, for those outside the department, a Red Book is this book that goes back over 100 years, which has the um, rules and regulations of the fire department, and it's. It's a fairly antiquated document. It was antiquated in 1999 when it was redrafted, I'm sure. And uh, it's antiquated today, so it's a good thing to redraft. And what else do I have on my list here? Um, that's what I, I'm, I think I've worked through all the uh, agenda items, which were pretty extensive. And we'll open up for um, local 916. And we had the award. You guys had the uh, your memorial service. Be able to hear. Yeah, you won't be able to attend that. You, you need to come up to the mic. You're, uh, they can't hear it. Um, John Howard, Secretary of Treasury, Local 916. Just want to say thank you for uh, taking care of Firefighter Ryan. And thanks for inviting us to the award ceremony. I think you had a good turnout from the board. And great, great event. It was a good event. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I see the volunteers are here. Do they have any comments? I just want to wish uh, everybody out there a very uh, happy holiday and a happy new year. Uh, just some safety tips. I know uh, the scented candles are very big at this time <laughs> of the year. Just be careful where you put them. Uh, placement, you know, not, not near curtains. Uh, space heaters that they use, the electric ones. Uh, all that kind of stuff with Christmas lights going up. Check your wires, your power strips, all those kind of things that all if your house has a fireplace or a wood burning stove or pellet stove in it make sure you read your owner's manuals on those things and just be a little bit safe but uh, if something should happen just dial 911 hey, Tommy where's your address I don't have we don't have your address where's your address where do you live 28 Maynard oh you, you live in uh, East Chester okay. Tucko. Tucko. okay so um, hold on one second Tommy the chief gave me something to give you. 
he's not here tonight, but I got these things for you here. And since you're here, you might as well have them. You want to grab these? I'll give you a couple copies. No, they're different. Um, so that's from that's from Chief Grogan, the one, and so the other is just a, the a renewal of the foil request we had sent out in the past. So you should have two there, right? Two different documents. You got two different documents there, Tom? No. Okay, you're all set. The same. And those two are the same, right? Yeah, right. Well, that's the official address for the uh, Volunteer Officers Association. So that's why it's that address. That's, that's what we have in the records, right? That's what, yeah. Course, right? The other thing is the New York State Controller's Office has communicated with us they're looking for the official address for the East Ch for the Benevolent Association so if you could email the chief the official address of the Benevolent Association the controller's office was looking for it somebody has to email them the Benevolent Association's address well whatever it is just email it to the email it to the chief and right but uh, okay if you want me to write it down now, I'll write it down now. What is it? The Benevolent, we're talking about the Benevolent Association. The, what's their address in East Chester? 127. 127, and that's in Tuckahoe, East Chester. And that would, I'm sorry? Fisher Avenue. Fisher Avenue, PO. Okay. 10709. Right. Communicate that to the chief then. What? Okay, we'll communicate that to the chief and he can forward it off their request. Um, yeah, so yeah, if anybody else wants a copy of those, I just handed out, you can have a copy here. So that was that. Um, okay, let me see what else do we have tonight. Any, we have to pay the bills, and tonight we have an extensive number of bills. Do you gentlemen preview the bills? Yeah, I got you've got over here a board member comment. I got a few comments I want to speak on. Okay, well, first let's do the bills and then we'll go to. If we, can we go to the bills first? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so there's four sets of vouchers tonight totaling $1,942,788 spot 20. So it's $1,942,788.20. So um, who would like, I'll, anybody want to make a motion to pay those? I'll make the motion to pay the bills. Mr. Lori and. I'll second it. Mr. Baker. Reluctantly. <laughs> you get a chance to see him? Yeah, yeah. I reviewed him in okay. executive session. Yeah, I reviewed him as well. Okay. I'm looking, looking for him. <clears throat> okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so that's the bills. So that's that. And I have board member comments. So I'd like to make a closing comment as well. Um, okay, I think I worked my way through the agenda. Does anybody else disagree with you? Anybody else have any comments that we need to... Before we adjourn, you want to make as he wants to make comments. I make a comment. I would like to thank uh, Mayor Eckland and the uh, Tuckahoe Board of Trustees, I believe it is, for mm -hmm. allowing us to meet here um, due to holiday season and people not being around, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The only time the board could get a quorum together was on times when other things were booked in spaces. Mayor Eckland uh, came forward, so. Yes, we can meet in other places, but uh, you know, it requires a little bit of uh, accommodation. And Mayor Eklund, thank you very much. And by the way, he's also a Boy Scout guy, 353. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll see him Sunday and thank him in person. Mr. Lori? Yeah, I got a few comments. First of all, one comment I got, uh, a man came to me, said that his, his mother's disabled and has a hard time taking her out. And he wants to know why she can't have an absentee ballot still pays her taxes in this town and she can't vote for fire commission well the law requires the board to have made that decision by um, 
last year uh, by the, I think it was a, someday in January in the past and I was a first-hand witness to this the absentee ballots were problematic and the way they're problematic is uh, unless you're disabled and you cannot make it to a polling place you shouldn't be using an absentee ballot if you're within the county and uh, we have a lot of senior citizen centers in town where people are not disabled they're just maybe at a bingo game and uh, somebody might walk into the bingo game and say how many people would like to vote the hands go up and then you have 30 or 40 absentee ballots and so uh, I think it was because of the problems the absentee ballots created years ago the board was reluctant to use absentee ballots now we also have only limited staff in the front office we only have part-time staff in the front office so if somebody comes by to pick up an absentee ballot generally someone's not there um, so I know it's unfortunate and we the ideal thing would be have the election in November which this board has tried to do repeatedly we went and tried to get New York State law changed so we wouldn't have this problem we got the governor to sign the law and the reason why we don't have absentee ballots is two people responsible for that one is the head of the Republican Party in Westchester County and one's the head of the Democratic Party in Westchester County because if they gave us the approval to put it on the November ballot then we would have absentee ballots and we wouldn't have a problem but since we have to run our elections and we only can pay people so much money to do it, uh, it gets very difficult to to do that. Okay, all right. Another thing, I I thought we passed the the ruling in the firehouses that there'd be no more smoking, and we said that you had to get off the property to smoke, and not to smoke in the firehouse. And um, the week of Thanksgiving, I went in the firehouse, and I walked through the mechanic shop, and there was about five guys back there smoking. They shouldn't be smoking in the building. Well, I don't want to say who's smoking, but I'm just saying there shouldn't be no smoking there. Otherwise, I'm going to suggest we bring back the beer in the firehouse or the wine in the firehouse. Now, we set, we set that rule, Mr. Chairman, and that should stay that way. Okay, another comment I made. I, just I want to say, I'm not sure how the consumption of alcoholic products in a firehouse has any bearing on cigarette smoking now well, you we pass the rule not to smoke you okay. go in there and the, and the individuals are smoking yeah now, we either stay with the rule or we don't stay with the rule no the, the rule is you're not opposed to smoke in the front of the firehouse where you can be seen or you're not opposed to be smoking mr. chairman in the back of the you shouldn't be smoking in the shop I had you should be smoking in the back of the back of the lot somewhere I had mentioned this once before when we were passing this rule and you says off the grounds they have to be. Now, I'm just mentioning that, and I don't want to see I, that I, happen. I, 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 I don't think really. we should send out a memo that says re Stop re smoking. states what the rule is and make well, sure that people. Let's, I, let's I, confirm I, the rule. I, I didn't think it was off the property. Yes, I thought it we was. Did. We said that because I had said I had asked you when we were passing that. Does that include the back or off the property? And we had said off the property. Now, if we're going to enforce these rules or make these regulations up, let's stick by them. I don't think we said off the property. I yes, think we I thought think we people could walk property. to the back lot of the firehouse and be away and not in the front because we thought it was a bad image for particularly young children yes, to see firemen front. smoking. And we and I had mentioned that means not on the property at all. And we says okay to that. I don't recall that. but I do. We'll check, we'll check the minutes. I mean, if, if we don't, I would even recommend that we change the policy so that they, <laughs> nobody should be smoking in the building why why should we not in the building not no one's smoking in the building, smoking in the building. there is no smoking in the building i says it in the mechanic shop that's in the building but there shouldn't be any smoking in the building all right that, well, that's that's what i'm saying yeah. that's no. exactly what i'm saying no you're saying property i mean assuming property if somebody's and in the rear of the parking lot what do you think of that no you know you could you smoke on a high school grad on the high school grounds no well in high school the children are generally well, under 18 well, years old. all right so be it. Here's another thing I want to be known. Now, it's just a year that I've been elected here, and I think I cooperated with everybody. Front office people, officers, paid personnel, volunteers, and everybody else. Now, I was accused of stabbing people in the back, and I was accused of doing things behind closed doors. I don't do those things, and I guarantee you I won't do those things. I'm not that type of person. And I don't want no one, I don't care who they are, paid personnel, volunteer, office people, to speak to me or any other commissioner that way. If that ever happens again, I promise you, and bring it back to everybody's meetings, 
I'll slap in subordination on you in no time. I'll let it go by this time, but it won't go happen again. There's five people on this board, and I have the authority of one-fifth. And I just let it go by because I knew the individual. But it won't happen again, and I promise you that. I, I brought, wait a minute, I'm not finished. I brought it to the attention of the chairman of the board, and his suggestion was for me to stay away from the firehouse until the elections are over, okay? That was just his suggestion. And that's not should, that shouldn't be said to anybody. I'm just a member here uh, of this board like anybody else is. And no one should talk to any commissioner with disrespect. And a gentleman, ladies and gentlemen, if you're listening to this, it won't happen again. I promise you that. Commissioner Lori, I don't think I've ever spoke to you disrespectfully. I didn't say you did, Dennis. Okay. I said an individual has accused me of stabbing him in the back and, do and doing things behind closed doors. Now, if you're going to accuse me or any member on this board, whoever does that, you better justify it. Because I don't do things that way. And I'm just telling you now, it better not happen again. I don't care who you are. And don't tell them, cut me off, Dennis, because I got the floor now. I was very angry, and I called you up and spoke to you about this. And it won't happen again, I promise you that. I don't think you need to raise your voice to your... Yes, I do. Here. I didn't think the individual had to raise his voice to me about it either, Dennis. Okay. All right. So, that sure finish your comments? Commissioner On that Curry? part, yes. Any other comments? Nothing right now. I'll think of okay. something before we close. Um, just at the, I'll just mention this just because I think it's fair to mention it. Um, in this room about a month ago, the, uh, the, the opponent in the race uh, who ran against me um, made statements that were just simply way off the mark, and I don't want people to think the fire district is other than what it is. We never raised anybody's ta any legal bills 600% in 2015. Uh, I would invite anyone who thinks we did to get a copy of the budget for 2015 and read it. And when you read the budget, you'll find out we moved line items where we added $200,000 in, in an engineering report for engineering expertise in the professional consultant line. And that professional consulting line was boosted up so we could do things like rebuild the Tuckahoe Firehouse, which we did last summer, which came out extremely well, and to get engineering reports like we did in Chester Heights and we can start moving forward on some of these projects. So the legal bills were not boosted up 600%. In fact, the legal line was reduced to zero because we moved everything up to uh, professional consultants. So that was just crazy, bizarre. Um, the other thing that was mentioned is that we have long-term debt because we did a TAN. A TAN is a tax anticipation note. We did a 35-day note because the town of Eastchester changed the way they forward money to the fire district. Typically, in, prior to 2013, they would send us one twelfth a month. So if we were to collect $12 million, for, for, amp, for example, they would send us a million dollars a month. In 2013, they changed how they did that, where they were going to give us a lump sum payment in May. That caused us a cash flow problem for several in, in between April and May. We probably had enough money in the bank to cover ourselves for that period. But we're a fire department and we didn't know whether we'd have an emergency or need cash. So what we did was under John Molinari's John Mulzeri, John Molinari's guidance, um, we he told us to issue a TAN. We issued a 35-day note. We did it at 0.88 interest rates with less than one percent. It cost us approximately seven hundred dollars. It was paid back 35 days later. We weren't allowed to go into our reserve account because had we gone into reserve account, that's actually a violation of New York State law to use your reserve account for operating budget. So therefore, we did a 35-day TAN. We paid it off by the middle of May. The debt was extinguished. We have no debt. We didn't have any debt. So as a candidate in an election, I found it somewhat shocking that you know these statements could be aired out there and no chance of rebuttal because the camera rolls all month long before the next village board meeting. And uh, you know, it, was really, it was really quite disturbing that people were getting this misinformation about the operations of the fire district. Also, the fire district, um, it was reported that we had $4 million missing in our, in our budget. And uh, nobody did better accounting than John Malzari. They just didn't do it better than he did. 
and you can look in a budget for reserve balances and you'll never find them reserve accounts are recorded in your audited financial statements or otherwise known your, your statement of financial condition so if you looked at our 2015 2014 2013 audited financial statements you would see our reserve accounts are fully are funded and we have roughly six million dollars overall uh, between reserve accounts and overall funding so I mean it was just I just didn't understand how these statements could be made how they stay out there and I think it's fair to correct the record and anybody has any questions they can just send us an email we'll send you the order the financials we will send you the balance sheets but I think this board has the utmost integrity has the utmost transparency and the utmost honesty as everybody in the front office that works there so and uh, and the chief has done a phenomenal job so that's what I'll say about that I just like to make one comment on that and not get, not to get into the law because even you know I'm a lawyer that puts me to sleep too the section you're talking about is section 6 of the general municipal law of the state of New York so it's it's general municipal law section 6 section 6 covers specifically fire districts and I'll give you the English version as opposed to the legal version if a fire commission if a board or any individual commissioner uses reserve funds that are for equipment building capital their, their capital expenditures for operating expenses it is an automatic it's a it's a crime and it's put in the statute and it's punishable by a misdemeanor well it's I'm sorry it's a crime at the misdemeanor level now obviously they'd have to try you and all that other stuff but that's what it says right in the section so you if you have hypothetically three million dollars in the bank and a reserve fund and you need to take two hundred thousand dollars to buy light bulbs and four hundred thousand dollars to pay the firemen you don't have three million dollars at your expense if you have to use um you have to use some other way to get the money and when the town of eastchester went from the monthly payment to the lump sum payment which frankly they should have been doing from day one they were 100 percent correct by doing 100 percent correct in doing that that's something that we got in trouble with on the audit that was done years ago our uh, our office was using what's known as the cash accounting method which is basically what you and I do at home I get my paycheck from work I figure it out blah 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 you cannot do that not only is it against the law it's bad accounting practices for a municipal uh, entity because we don't sell things we don't have money coming in every month we have a tax lump sum that we're supposed to get so that's why all that happened. And for those of you who are still awake at home, have a happy holiday and Merry Christmas. And I, have, and I have one more comment. I just want to thank everyone who came out and voted. I appreciate the support. I appreciate that 1,600 people in town voted and on a, on a Tuesday in December. Um, and uh, I just think it was it's always good uh, to get a large number of turnout, regardless who you vote for. Getting a large turnout is very good. And I would, you know, I'd like to thank all those people who came out and voted. Tom Andres for running the election, all the elections inspectors, the people who set up the machines, and uh, everybody who, you know, encouraged votes to go out, whether it's on the opposition side or my side. Anybody who encouraged votes to go out is a good thing, and, uh, and thank everybody for doing that, and I wish everybody a happy and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and safe holiday. I, yes. I just want to reinnovate that Merry Christmas. Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, and a happy and healthy New Year to all of you. I think we should close the meeting tonight in honor of John Molzari, um, Nick Dietrich, because we didn't do it last month on television, and, uh, and Mrs. Longo, who, who, who just passed away. So uh, I'll get a motion to close the meeting. Make the motion. A second. Second. Mr. Baker, all in favor? Aye. 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 And now a moment of silence. <laughs>